Street Haven celebrates achievements in supporting homeless women in downtown East. Street Haven is a multi-service agency that supports women and LGBTQIA2S plus community members in the downtown East area with fully integrated and diverse services such as emergency shelter, supportive housing, and addiction treatment program, and a learning center. On September 26th, Street Haven, Canada's first women's shelter, celebrated their achievements in supporting homeless women in the downtown East core at their annual general meeting. The event took place at the Regent Park Community Center, 402 Shooter Street, Banquet Hall, and was moderated by Street Haven's Executive Director, Siu Mi Shang, and Street Haven's Board of Directors, Chair Cheryl Son. The meeting agenda included Street Haven 2023 AGM, 2022 to 2023, a year in review, and looking ahead. Walpole Award winner 2023, Outstanding Community Partner, Jessica Bell and Kristen Wontam, members of Provincial Parliament, University Rosedale and Toronto Centre, respectively. Guest speaker, Teresa Makhumi, an African refugee's journey and street haven experience. Guest speaker, Andrew Heisch, Director, Statistics Canada, Perspectives on Housing Trends in Canada, Ontario, and Toronto. For this presentation, Andrew Heisch presented census data and sociodemographic and housing trends for the Regent Park neighborhood and explored how the revitalization efforts have had an impact in specific areas of Regent Park. In 2022 to 2023, Street Haven has seen a significant need for support for women and members of the LGBTQIA2S plus community, as every night their shelters filled to capacity due to the scarcity of affordable housing in Toronto. And before starting the AGN, uh, I am delighted to invite Tanya, who will offer up her own land acknowledgement on behalf of the, uh, the organization. Would you? Um, Anishna, um, Tanya Marie Dijnikaz, Kapida Koyevit, and Dijnikaz AIN, Kiko Nang Donjiba, Minwa Mong and Dodem. Hello, hi, how are you? My name is Tanya Marie George. My spirit name is Kapida Koyevit, one who looks inside herself. And I'm from Catalan Stony Point First Nation, and I am from the Loon Clan. Um, the City of Toronto acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The City also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. The City of Toronto has been acknowledging the traditional territory since March 2014 due to conversations with Indigenous leaders including the Aboriginal Advocacy Committee as part of the 2018 Toronto for All campaign, the language the City of Toronto uses has um, evolved. Land acknowledgement and guidance. Thank you. And there are several areas that uh, we were able to uh, advance and leverage the partnership piece. Um, it's just going to be a series of slideshows, I think, at this point in time. Um, one is that we were able to introduce new programs and also we were able to secure support to build the agency's first dedicated mental health crisis and trauma team. This is an area that has been um, a huge need in all of our program areas in shelter and supportive housing and in our addictions um, programs. And so having that ability through the support of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Pearson Foundation, as well as um, through um, the Regent Park Social Development uh, Fund has really enabled us to move towards that space of finally being able to revive this in-house support uh, to our clients. 
Um, we also, this year, piloted our first um, post-treatment transitional housing program. It's actually really to focus on clients who are in addiction services who have not been able to find housing, who actually are homeless or housing insecure. And um, for us, there has been a huge concern that many of these clients, once they graduate from the addictions treatment program, they're often left uh, to return back to unsafe situations. And hence, the program was created really as a response to meet the needs of these particular clients. And so we piloted that program in 22-23, and we're I'm pleased to say that we're uh, focusing on scaling that program in the coming year and looking for more support in order to service more clients. So that's a really critical program. Um, that's a program that will really have a huge impact from a health perspective um, as well as a social care perspective for our clients. Some of the other key areas of improvement for us was that we actually standardize our data collection and we're very pleased to say that uh, we are now collecting a, a large common set of data across all of our program areas and we're collecting around 92 data points. Um, the staff have been really good at, at systematically collecting that data in our shelter, in our housing, as well as in our addictions treatment and training programs. And now this allows us to tell a better um, a sense or at least a, a better illustration of who our clients are, what their needs are, and the commonality and the differences between the different um, service uh, client groups that we serve. Well. Another area that we also really focused on in the last uh, fiscal year was to really focus on taking a stronger advocacy stance over the past year. And many of you actually were part of these efforts um, around trying to increase the attention around affordable housing and countering the issue around homelessness, um, including our day of action back in March of uh, 2023. And some of you will see yourselves in there. Um, that's one of my favorite pictures of the year. Um, another key area of success for us was also in our walkathon, and um, sorry, our, our walkathon in which we're able to uh, attract 80 walkers, and uh, we reached our fundraising target as well as us uh, securing a number of corporate sponsors. The last huge focus for us in 22-23 was really about building culture. We really wanted to continue to focus our efforts on recognizing the hard work that our staff had uh, really done in the past few years, especially during the pandemic. We know that those were hard years for staff as well as for our clients. And we really wanted an opportunity to recognize all of that hard work. So we made investments in supporting staff in their growth. We held staff appreciation events. This picture uh, is also another one of my favorite pictures on the right. Um, because that shows um, that on that board there are 27 names and those 27 names represent over 100 person years of work experience at Three Haven and um, that kind of tenure you just really don't see a lot of anymore but that goes to show you how dedicated and um, passionate our staff are to the agency and their loyalty to the agency so it's, uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. Despite all of this great stuff that we did do, it's important to note that actually in August of 2022, when society was reopening and the seventh wave was ending, um, we actually had the worst outbreak we ever had in the entire span of the COVID. And um, we actually had two waves of it successively and nearly every single client, for instance, in our shelter ended up with COVID and a number of our staff also ended up with COVID. It was, it had a huge impact uh, on staff and um, just you know that burden on, on the management team and on the staff team. Um, but despite that, they soldiered on, they did a great uh, job. We were able to contain it. It did not spread to the other programs, which is kudos to the entire Street Haven team. Um, and uh, fingers crossed as we move into the, the upcoming flu season. Um, so that despite that, we were still able to achieve all these um, great successes in the last 22, 23 years. So um, hats off and plan back to the team at Street Haven. <laughs> now I'm going to return the mic back to Cheryl to talk about what's coming up. All right, so a lot has happened in the past year, and there will be more happening in the year ahead. So I think on the government's level, it's not only about revising the bylaw, and uh, also um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that will be one of the key focus at the board level and also on, um, at the organization level as well. So it started 
uh, from the board, and that will be one of our key focus in terms of bringing on new board members to ensure that at the board level we are also reflecting the community that we serve, and we also have expertise that contribute to the ambitious growth plan that we have in place. And then also on the uh, on the st strategic level, we will be re revising our vision and mission statement. A lot has happened. A lot has changed. COVID and also, you know, the organization have, has grown so much. So we, the board, uh, one of the key initiative is we will uh, we will do a revision of the uh, vision, mission, and value to ensure that it's reflective of the current state and then also our future growth. And. On top of that, uh, we will also be revising our logo as well in preparation for the 60th anniversary of Street Haven, 60 years of anniversary of Street Haven. That will be in March 2025. So if anyone don't know, we are the oldest shelter in Canada. And um, so yeah, we're on applause for that. <laughs> And also on the more business side, we will we are a housing agency, and talking about housing is the one of probably the biggest topic happening right now in Canada. We are in a massive housing crisis. So on the real estate side for Street Haven, we are also looking at uh, revising our real estate strategy and looking at ways how we can increase density, how we can manage to have more beds, because more beds means more less women up on the street. So we will also be delighted to um, you know, work on revising Street Haven's real estate strategy with, in partnership with several organizations. And then also set, um, you know, partners, some of you are in, in audience today. So really looking forward to that. And lastly, um, welcome the new board of directors and to join the team and to be a part of this ambitious growth plan and to continue to make a difference to the community we serve and to all the vulnerable women um, that's in need of our service. And uh, I will pass back the mic to Sumi. So um, at the operational level from, um, in terms of the translation of several of our uh, strategic directions, the key area of focus um, that we really want to continue to um, expand our efforts on is to really deepen and expand the existing resources we have, but also introduce new programs and services for our clients. So we mentioned the post-treatment um, uh, issue around uh, addictions clients who complete their treatment and not, especially the homeless ones, not having a safe place to return to. And so we will be focusing on scaling that program and looking for um, support and partnership from various levels of government to really try and highlight the critical issue and the intersection of addiction and homelessness. Um, we have a, a very sad statistic that I've been using to try and create the sense of urgency with uh, policymakers and decision makers, and that is we recently looked into our three-year data and we found that the death rate is seven in 100 over the course of three years for addictions treatment clients who graduated from the program. And this really speaks to the level of risk that exists and the concern that exists and the fact that housing cannot be ignored when it comes to the issues around addictions. And so this really highlights a picture and an illustration that this is a public health matter, this is a social justice issue, and this is also a women's issue. And the other piece too, of course, is really rolling out our mental health team. That program must be put in place this coming year. Again, the sense of urgency, especially with um, society opening up and just the challenges and the growing complexity amongst our client base and all of our programs um, is something that we do want to focus on. There's exciting programs that we brought on board in 22-23, including the Life Stabilization Program. I see one of our staff is there. Um, and this is a program that actually goes out into the community and stabilizes individuals who are at risk of losing their housing. And so um, parts of that also include uh, needs around supporting folks who may not have access to mental health. And we're also focusing on other exciting initiatives, especially around supporting aging in place. Um, up until the refugee crisis, uh, there was an alarming uh, trend in which we saw a number of our, uh, a large cohort of our shelter clients actually aging homeless in our shelters. Um, and it was actually reaching almost 40% until the refugee crisis came. And that has changed our cohort. 
Um, this doesn't negate the fact that clearly older adults are aging homeless and they're aging in deep poverty. And we do have a number of our supportive housing units in which uh, the cohorts are actually aging and showing very complex needs. We're partnering, a uh, really exciting partnership with um, a geriatric psychiatrist who's going to be coming in and, and really diving deep and looking at the intersection of chronic homelessness and what that looks like when someone is in supportive housing and how that translates to care both on the social side and on the housing side. So we're really excited with that partnership. Another key piece, as Cheryl mentioned, is the whole real estate issue. That is a conversation that we talk about almost every single day at Street Haven. Uh, we may be smallish, but we have huge ambitions um, and we really, really want to expand the number of beds we have or the number of rooms that we build our housing units for more and more clients. We have been turning away so many women because we're at capacity and we really sense and, and see the demand in our communities. That pent up demand is, is, is really huge. Um, and 91 Pembroke, which is right next to uh, Canada's oldest women's shelter program, is our supportive housing unit, and there is a, um, there's going to be a huge effort right now to that we will be embarking on in terms of expanding, hopefully tripling, within the year and a bit to the supportive housing units at that location. And that is a huge ambition of ours because we sense the demand that exists right now between um, the chronically homeless and those who are coming here to Toronto. We'll also be embarking on stronger advocacy roles in several areas, including raising awareness not only around the homeless crisis and the housing affordability issue, but also the refugee crisis. And right now, those three are intersecting right squarely at Street Haven. Our shelter currently houses 90% uh, of our shelter clients, for instance, are currently uh, African refugee claimants or refugees. One year ago, that was only a third. So you can see how that trend is impacting our agency. And so we do want to raise awareness at Queen's Park as well as at the federal level. We hope that you'll join us. We are actually planning, along with a lot of other agencies, National Housing Awareness Day on November 22nd. Um, I'm really just trying to make sure that that voice isn't forgotten as the government focuses on building their budget for the next fiscal year. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, we are committing to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and that's something that we will be undertaking at the organizational level. And lastly, as Cheryl mentioned, the huge launch for our 60th anniversary. We're planning already on the operational level as the board does their very critical work <laughs> reviewing and revising the vision and mission. So the last news I wanted to share, I've been so excited and uh, I'll probably get in trouble at some point, but there is an embargo on this news, but we are actually the ONFA 2023 Award of Excellence recipient. We're so excited. And uh, Street Haven has created a award called the Walpole Award. And we're extremely pleased to um, hand out this award to our recipient this year. Um, this year's theme is about collective impact and how uh, through a collaboration partnership we can bring about greater impact. So we created this Walpole Award and it's named in honor of our fearless leader and founder Peggy Ann Walpole. Many of you may be aware of her origin story. She actually was an emergency room with St. Mike's and also with Don Valley Jail. And she noticed that a lot of the women that were being served in the hospital who were marginalized um, were not actually being fully supported. They were just kind of being, um, you know, left to fall through the social safety net cracks at that point in time back in the 60s. And so, um, as someone who uh, has a strong sense of social justice, she turned around and created a 24-hour drop-in center for these women to, to go to, to, to at least have a safe place to go to. And three years later, she created Canada's first women's shelter in, uh, in the downtown East area. Um, and years later, we, we also created a um, residential treatment program, our supportive housing program. Um, so this year, we've created a, a, we wanted to recognize a community partner who's shown outstanding community impact. And this year, we'd like to recognize um, really who my, in my mind, I don't think Kristen and Jess know this, at the dynamic duo, I call them dynamic, the dynamic duo at Street Haven. So Jess Bell, um, who's our MPP for University of Rosedale, and Kristen Wong Tam, who's our MPP for Toronto Centre. We wanted to award them this, um, this award. These two incredible leaders and women have shown unfailing support to Street Haven, have helped us garner support at various government levels, um, and they've been there for us for our various events, including our fundraisers and recognition days. 
and have really advanced our cause on ending homelessness and housing affordability and dealing with the issue of housing affordability for women. They've really made an impact to Street Haven, the communities we serve, and um, really advance the cause that we hold very dear. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Kristen and um, Jess, unfortunately, sends her regrets to come up and accept this award um, and uh, say a few remarks. So. Thank you so incredibly um, for this honor, and you know, I, I just tell you that uh, I'm going to hold this up one, one more time just because I think it's, uh, let me get out of the light if that's okay. Um, I can only imagine that if, if, if I was in a position right now, as I once was at age 16 when I found myself homeless after coming out of the closet, um, and someone handed me a key, and a key to my home. I, I think my heart would just explode it. So I want this experience for everyone in the community that you serve. Um, it's not lost on me that Street Haven does exceptional work. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to say thank you um, because, you know, even though Sume and, and Cheryl and the board and all of you are kind enough to recognize um, the work that Jessica Bell and I are doing at Queen's Park and in the community, um, it's really nothing. It's you know, it's it's the it's who we are as advocates around housing and trying to do everything we can to alleviate the violence that we know impacts people when they experience poverty and homelessness, mental health and addictions. Um, but you're doing the hard work. You are doing the work that is life-saving and life-transforming and life-affirming. So although our names are on that block, uh, quite honestly, I would be easily ha and happy to rededicate the award to the entire board, including the new ones, because you will be earning that <laughs> key. Um, but also to the staff, um, to the fearless leaders here at the front of the room, um, and to the clients who are here. It is a very difficult time in this city, the most prosperous city in Toronto, one of the wealthiest cities in North America and around the world. Uh, we live in a remarkable, extraordinary country. Um, and yet we see so many people falling behind. And I know that's why you do this work. I, I know it because it's, it's not easy work. Um, but I also know that we couldn't do what we do without you on the ground in the community pushing as hard as you do. I have had a chance to travel across, obviously, Charles Center, not that big, um, but I've had a chance to travel and speak to colleagues across Ontario. And I can tell you that the housing crisis, the housing crisis is so deep in Ontario, in the north, in rural communities, indigenous communities, uh, right across Ontario. In some of our communities up north in our, in our most northern parts of the, the, the province, they, the rate of homelessness is almost 50%, as described to me by my colleagues. And when it comes to partners who are living in areas without adequate uh, transportation or housing, uh, the cost of living and the rise, of, the rise of inflation has really just, you know, whatever was left over in the cupboard wasn't a lot but that's even harder now than it's ever been. So you're working in some, some, you're working in space, trying to bring a lot of attention to an issue that is only deepened. And what I wanted to share with you today um, is that in the past two years, and I've had a chance to serve, serve the public, to serve our community for 13 years now, but in the past two years in particular, I've seen the remarkable, innovative leadership of Street Haven break through all of that. And, and it's not easy to do because this organization is not very large. 
as, as noted, smallish. Um, you're not very large. And you're, you're working in space in this city where you have a lot of big players with you know, uh, a government relations team. They are moving through uh, different offices with ministers and associate ministers, especially at Queen's Park. Um, and with all due respect to those organizations, they become quite pleasant to deal with. And, and that's good, because you need to be courteous and, and polite. But I found that they are not pushing as hard with the same level of urgency that I think that they need to. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm an opposition member, so therefore we always get loud anyways. Our job is to provide constructive, critical wisdom so that the government does what they need to do to, do, to deliver good laws and to deliver opportunities for people in Ontario. But I'm saying this is because you're at this critical juncture in time where you're small enough to be nimble and innovative and I have seen Street Haven over the past two years in particular, always done, good, always done great work, but over the last two years, you have actually lit a spark in a housing and homelessness sector in Toronto that I think has been feeling really tired and bruised because of the challenges of the pandemic and the crisis has deepened. So whatever you're doing, pushing outside the envelope, setting up new innovative programs, connecting the links between shelter support as well as transitional homes and supportive housing, and then making sure that there's a wraparound component, component that has mental health and addictions attached to it, and recovery, recovery is so innovative right now. I can honestly say you folks are pushing outside the margins in ways I haven't necessarily seen for an organization of your size. So what I want to leave you with is a message of encouragement, is to keep going. It sounds to me you're going to be embarking on some remarkable work ahead that's going to need the public and private sector. The, the board who is well-versed in, in experts in your field is going to be asked to dig deep, I suspect, not just financially, always do. Um, but you're going to be asked to open your Rolodex to bring in your sphere and network. And so every single one of us who loves and supports the work that Street Haven does is going to be asked to do the same thing because you're already leading the charge. And I can guarantee you that Jess, Jessica Bell and myself We'll be with you every step of the way at Queen's Park. Um, although we're not in government, not to get hyper-partisan, but I will for a moment. Um, we don't have the type of championship at this moment in Queen's Park where you get even an audience. You should at least be able to get a meeting and you should be able to get an audience with a cabinet minister or a Minister of Housing or Associate Minister of Housing, you should be able to get a response beyond the basic courtesy reply from the Associate Minister of Health and, and, and Mental Health and Addiction because you're a partner to the solution. And so I want to be there at Queen's Park reminding the ministers and the Associate Ministers that if they met you halfway, even halfway, you will deliver the solutions and the proposed solutions and the tried and true delivery of method and, and results that will actually help them do their work. That I'm very confident of. If there's an organization out there in the downtown east that is leading this conversation and rallying your peers to the table as I've seen this year, what Sue May and the Street Haven did, team did at Queen's Park with very, little short runway, how you were able to occupy the media room, grab the attention of, of the press gallery with a lot of competing stories at that time of day, be able to organize a housing lobby day to raise the issue that you identified that needed more attention. You brought the sector together. You brought the sector together at Queen's Park you brought a focus to the conversation that was really powerful 
and it was noted, people paid attention that something was changing in the political waters in the community. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to all that you are, are doing on behalf of the community that's so desperately needing your support. And we want to be able to continue to work with you, because that's important, and, and building those partnerships where you do have the most powerful impact. We do this together. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I think now really concludes kind of our section at Street Haven, and we're excited to kind of introduce the second half of the event today uh, by introducing our first guest speaker and also our wonderful client who's amazing. I actually have to say I can't, I'm a fan. Caroling her, I like. I I can't say enough things about Teresa. She's amazing in every way. Um, so let me introduce Teresa. She was born in Kenya. She is from part of Africa. She's the third born in the family of three brothers and has always wanted to serve her country and her people. She is trained as a water engineer and actually worked uh, for the municipal municipality of uh, Nairobi. Correct? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, and uh, she's here to uh, tell her experience as an African refugee claimant, her journey from Africa to Toronto, and her experience as a Street Haven shelter client, and some great news that I'm sure she's going to share with us uh, since the last time I saw her. So please come on up, Teresa, and stand by the mic so you don't have to stand. Up. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a story about a beautiful home. A serene, peaceful home located at the crossroads in the downtown of Toronto. One day, I hope you will walk this path to a pavement that leads to a wonderful warm haven. With these incredible humans, you will, who will treat you with so much kindness that you don't know what to do with it. One day, you'll be welcomed to a beautiful home with a backyard full of color, valor, and flowers. You'll forget the hurt, the confusion, and the anxiety that life has thrown to you. You'll realize that some people are good to your heart and gentle to your soul. They bring a clear of love and infectious laughter to your life. They bring a sprinkle of rainbow and the kind of sunlight you do not want to lose. You'll bring, they will bring, you will again learn to trust the process and gradually, everything will start falling in place. Good evening, folks. My name is Teresia Makumi. You may call me Teresa. I'm a trained water technician. I come from the eastern part of Africa, Kenya. I'm happiness, I'm free, I'm authentic, and I'm bold. I worked for the city municipal in the capital city of Nairobi. I had a good run. I served with both diligence and integrity, but I wasn't honest to self. Phrases like, you work like a man, you look and act with aggressiveness like a man, would creep on my being. I still read things, while deep down, I knew I wasn't doing very well. After high school, I knew for a fact I was different. I was unique in one way or another. I tried to conform to whatever life was throwing at me. But one day, the cat was out of the bag. I had to run for my dear life. It remains a cardinal sin, illegal constitutionally, for you to identify as gay back home. I called my brother Hannah and my girlfriend Margaret one evening and told them I was going away, far away from home. If they board me at the airport, I'm not going to come back home. They looked at me worried. I explained I really had to go bearing the circumstances. At that particular point, without doubt, I knew I had to jump. I took my suitcase with only $200 in my pocket. A car pulled into the departure segment at the largest airstrip in Kenya, the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Longest journey of my life started. I had one agenda, to start again, but this time, true to self. With shattered dreams, zero self-esteem and cluttered mindset, I started a journey to the unknown. I'm with only YouTuber vlogs and a Google as a guide. 
I landed in Canada after 16 hours of being in air. With only a suitcase and a fleece blanket, I searched for MCC Toronto. In my mind, I kept thinking like home, I would get refuge in the church. A red taxi pulled over outside the Pearson airport, and the driver with a pidgin English accent asked me, Sister, you bought taxi, take where to go? I said yes, MCC Toronto. I sat at the far back of the second seater wagon. I was tired, I was exhausted. I would fall asleep only to wake up confused at intervals. The driver cheekily kept turning back. He eventually, he eventually gathered courage and asked me, what was I going to do in church on a Wednesday evening? I answered, to seek a sailor. What? He exclaimed. You don't seek a sailor in church in Canada. I will take you to an address and you're going to ring the bell and say, I want to see Kaseila. Later that day, I ended up at Peter Street uh, after a heavy traffic. I stood right there in the desert. I monitored the train, ring the bell and wait. I marked my steps. So I went in, rang the bell and waited. How can we help you? A voice asked. I'm a refugee, came in from Kenya. Could you please help me with bed and food? Your name again? So this time, I shouted, Teresia Makomi, spell it. I spelled it, good. I gonna bring you something to eat. The door opened. On top of the window panes, a small container of apple juice and a fruit sandwich was placed there. Go ahead and help yourself. An invisible voice again instructed. After I had picked, the door closed. Up to date, I still wonder why and how they are so careful at Peter Street, you know. They don't show their faces or the persons having you. I thought that's weird. I sat outside and I sat outside and you'll bear me witness. Canadian buildings lack verandas. So when you sit outside Peter Street, you down on the pavement. I had many worries that I did not care how that night went. My journey to Canada had begun. That night, it was so chilly since it was just the close of spring and getting to summer. I kept not getting numb and so cold. I learned a trick at Peter Street. After every 30 minutes, I would ring the bell. I request I wanted to ease myself. This served the trick. I would pull my suitcase, go in, ease myself for so long, gather enough warmth, and walk again with my suitcase, only to keep repeating this after every 30 minutes. It worked the trick. Morning came, served the same apple juice and fruit sandwich for breakfast. I was advised by one of the staff in the morning shift to try get a Canadian SIM card and maybe try a number she wrote to me. I dashed to the store nearby pulling my suitcase. My feet felt heavy. I wanted to just lie down on the road and sleep. I was so broken down. One thing, however, that kept me going was the fact that I was in Canada, a first world country. I was away from the traumas, the pain, the insults, the ridicule, and the embarrassment. I still had a small glimpse of hope. And that may be what I hold so precious still today, a small speck of hope. I pulled myself to Peter Street, determined to call the central intake number. Like life depended on just that, I made it my business to call the number after every 30 minutes. A force kept pushing me. Night fell again. The street of Toronto feels so empty Live alone so cold in the night. I kept calling the number. I started requesting boldly for a place to sleep. I said, help me. It's my second night here. In the streets, I'm a woman who has been treated bad. Please help me. Later that night at about 3 a.m., the worker at Central Intake finally mentioned a bed had been found at 87 Pembroke Street. 
He instructed a couple to take me there. My heart skipped. I was in a bad shape. But finally, a sprinkle of rainbow, like a sign of hope, had eventually dawned. I tracked my feet to the door at 87 Pembroke Street. The, the taxi driver encouraged, go ahead and ring the bell. I'm watching over you, he said. A young lady stood by the door. She smiled at me and said, welcome home, dear. We were expecting you. She helped me with the suitcase. She mentioned her name was Sinto and went ahead to tell me about my new home. She noticed I was shivering. What may I offer you? She asked. Tea, coffee, some dinner, some snack. I took tea at the dining. For once, I learned the value of having a roof over my head. She showed me to the bathroom, a new pair of pajamas, warm, bright and clean. She even helped me to make my bed. I was awoken by a soft tap. Hey, good afternoon. Happy Women's Day. At the backyard, a nice scent of smoked meat and fries engulfed the whole building. I was invited to the feast. We were celebrating women. It was International Women's Day. It was our day. We toasted Jesus to every woman. Welcome home, Teresa, Bobby said. We are so happy to be part of your journey. Welcome to Canada. Welcome to Street Haven. Later that afternoon, as I took a bath, I remember for the first time in my life after very so many years, looking at myself in the mirror and affirming to myself, I'm gay, I'm unique, and this is my truth. A weight was lifted off my chest. I felt free. I felt home. A safe space I had found. I have entered into a new space, home away from home. Every of the staff who came introduced themselves to me. Like it's not enough, they asked about my story. Have you gotten a lawyer? Have you written the narrative? How may we help you? I felt the newness, all around acceptance. The respect, the respect of simplicity, like how may I address you, built in a sense of belonging. You should visit the shelter on Saturday evenings, the karaoke nights. We put on our dancing shows. Music and beautiful voices fill in the air. Each woman sing to their own voice, own language, but united by the fact that we belong to one tribe, the tribe of strength, the tribe of fixing each other's crown without necessarily saying it was broken. I arrived in Canada about five months ago. I was at the near edge. They say charity begins at home. My only home, my only host, my only Canadian relative, the only sense of belonging, the only place I get to dream and raise hope again is street heaven. Here, you are welcomed with love and acceptance, the giggles, the laughter at the backyard, by the summer dimmed evenings, the signature meals. I'm a non gluten, I'm a non lactose, and non dairy products. The chef makes sure there's something kept aside for me. They don't tire to kindness. Last week, I landed my first job in Canada. Not in the factory, no. A nice, decent office. In fact, there were two. I took in the pride of having my Ontario case worker intervene to, uh, to both of the employers, convincing each other to let me go to either. My sisters at the shelter too were recently taught to a 10-week pathway program. They all graduated, and for some, it really felt like one big achievement, as this is the only graduation in a class they have attended with so much insights. The Canadian resumes in place the cover letters in check. You hear them brag and show off the different certificates awarded after the hard work. Eager to face the world again with confidence, they put the best foot forward during interviews. Jobs have been realized, dreams have been awakened, conversations have started, individual narratives are being told, their faces are shining, there is hope, 
Women, women have been positively impacted. Solitude and traumas have slowly faded away. A new sense of hope is born. Confidence restored. A glimpse of heavenly conquer. We are ready for the next phase. Ready to impact like our master. For they say, the oasis, from the oasis so does the river derive its taste. Our candle has been lit. We are ready to light the world. Today, my sisters and I are ready. The housing team is placing us to some nice cozy homes, bidding us farewell and wishing us all the best of luck and our wishes to come true. We are confident, we are hopeful, we are restored, and we are determined. We are the product of Street Haven. Thank you, Street Haven at the Crossroads. and continued success. Uh, you know that you'll always have screen even at your back. So congratulations on all your successes that you've been able to achieve here. Um, I'd now like to introduce our last and final speaker, and that is Andrew. He is the director of the Center for Income and Socioeconomic Wellbeing Statistics uh, of Statistics Canada, is responsible for our census survey and administrative data programs on income, housing, and wealth and other responsibilities um, from 2018 to 2020, Andrew implemented uh, the data and measurement component of the Canadian uh, Poverty Reduction Strategy, and from 21 to 23, Andrew implemented the data component of the Federal Quality of Life Strategy. Andrew is a member of the Human Capital Policy Council of the City Howe Institute, and is a member of the Luxembourg Income Study Advisory Board and chair of the UNECE group of experts on measuring poverty and inequality. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Andrew to Hi, everyone. Um, that was such a wonderful story um, and a wonderful history, a personal history. Um, I feel humbled uh, to follow it. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I can live up to that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. I'll do what I was asked to come here to do, and I'll talk to you about data <laughs> and statistics and um, you know, about those, those, those terrible abstractions from real life that, that, that you know, kind of distract um, us people in Ottawa from real life, I think, sometimes. But thank you, Teresa, for that uh, incredible story. So, what I want to tell you about is um, so 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 about me. I um, I grew up in Barry, okay. So in the '80s. Um, so you all know where Barry is. It's a little bit northy here, about 100 kilometers. And um, from time to time, I would come down to Toronto, usually with my parents. Um, and usually during the day, we'd see a Blue Jays game. Um, you know, my parents were kind of homebodies. We didn't really come down that much. And I remember coming down for the first time on my own. Well, I wasn't really on my own. I was on a school trip. Um, and uh, it was a nighttime thing. And there were about 20, 25 of us in a club. And what, they, uh, what the club, I can't remember what the club, what the objective of the club was. But what the activity was, was they set this 25 kids, about 14 or 15 years old, free in the Toronto subway, okay? And um, we were in groups of two or three, and it was October. And the activity was, was we were to go from station to station and walk up or run up or excitedly approach complete strangers and ask them, are you a friend of the Great Pumpkin? Okay? Because um, it, was, it, was, it was Christmas, or sorry, it was Easter. <laughs> no, it wasn't any of those Halloween. things. It was Halloween. <laughs> I'll get there. I'm nervous. <laughs> And, and so it, uh, the part of this activity was there, are, there were actually people at, at some of the stations who would say yes, and, and there were plants there from the school, like the school planted people. And if you found one of these people, they would give you a clue, and you would then go to another station. It's like they might say, um, the clue might be, my favorite color is green, right? So you, okay, now I've got to go to St. Patrick's. So once you got it, you know, on the rhythm, it wasn't so bad, but you were running around these stations. Um, uh, asking complete strangers, are you a friend of the Great Pumpkin? Okay. So the reason why I bring this up is because um, it's nighttime and it's Toronto and it's a big city, 
And we weren't supposed to leave the subway station, but at one point we did, the group I was with. And we just ducked outside for a moment. And it must have been down in the financial district. And uh, you know, I emerged from one of those subway stations, couldn't tell you which one it was. And I was surrounded by these immense tall buildings. And the lights were on, of course, because it was nighttime. And honest, I've never seen anything like it. Like, it, was just, uh, it was just an amazing sight. Uh, that's downtown Toronto in the 1980s. And when I look back on that now, um, I have a lot of different thoughts, but one of them is, you know, I can't believe that was a school sanctioned event. <laughs> the 80s were such a great time, it's so different. Um, but anyway, when I was preparing this, I found this picture, um, and that's taken uh, off of Bleecker Street apparently, so that's not too far from here, I think. And that's, that's the downtown skyline in the 1980s. I don't think I, that's, the pit, that's not the view I saw. The view I saw was like this kind of view. But um, yeah, uh, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I've had a couple of occasions over my career to come down and speak to people in Toronto. Um, uh, and it's, it's, always, it's always such a pleasure. So, um, <laughs> Everybody in this room knows more about, or at least just as much about housing as I do. Okay. So these are all things that we know. You just, you know, you can feel them uh, that are happening. You can feel these things happening around you. The population is growing fast, right? Um, house prices have been rising fast. Rents are increasing. Uh, incomes have fallen behind. There's not enough affordable housing. You know, investors, foreign owners. Airbnb, these, these all form part of the story somehow, they get a lot of attention. And outcomes are spread unequally across groups. Um, mean, by that I mean um, there are haves and have-nots, if you will, or winners and losers in the housing game. Okay? And they get spread unequally across groups. And, and sometimes the groups are um, you know, groups that can, uh, you know, uh, uh, racialized groups, for example, or um, uh, or young people or seniors, like outcomes are spread unequally. And of course, homelessness remains a challenge. Over the course of uh, the next 20 slides or so, I'm going to walk you through just some statistics on all of these things. Um, and what I want to leave you with is that they all kind of interact with one another. Like I think that that, that is kind of a mistake to say, um, here's the shelter cost, you know, or the number. And that's what we should be using as our North Star. Or here's the immigration statistics, and that's what we should be using as a North Star. I think in order to really get a full picture of what's going on in housing, you need to look at it from a number of directions, right? You need to look at the people. You need to look at the places. You need to look at the money, like the financial aspect of things. And then you need to look at the politics. <laughs> but I'm from Statistics Canada. I'm a representative of the federal government. I'm actually working right now <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm never off the record as an employee of Statistics Canada. So I'm going to keep away from the politics side. It's not, it's not my role or responsibility. I'm a data guy. Okay? But I will try to sew together a narrative with these other kinds of statistics. Um, and I hope you find it interesting and insightful. Um, and I'll just, with that, I'll just uh, start away here. So sometimes at, at, at Statistics Canada, like we're, we're really data nerds, and sometimes we think about um, the idea that maybe like demography is destiny. So that's one of those vectors that I want to leave you with, and how important the demographic situation is to what's going on around us. Um, that little graphic there shows our population estimate for Toronto uh, for the last 20 years, and it's gone up by almost 2 million people. Now that's the metropolitan area of Toronto, but I'll show you later, a lot of that growth is in the city center. Um, and so that's incredible growth by any stretch of the imagination. Um, a lot of that, the positive part of that uh, uh, population growth was international migration. Um, you know, births still outnumber deaths um, among uh, the Canadian born population. Um, but most population growth nowadays comes from international migration. And if you look out further, Toronto's population is actually projected to surpass 10 million people by 2041. So that's, that's another, <laughs> I'm doing the math here in my head, and it's like 3 million more people 
um, in, uh, in, in 20 odd years from now. Um, Toronto is going to be a, a, a much bigger proportion of Canada in terms of population in 20 years than it is now, if it keeps growing along the path that it is right now. And, uh, and Sumi was, was joking a lot today about how Toronto's different. You know, Toronto's different. <laughs> and you're right, she's right. Toronto is different. Um, it's different from the rest of Ontario, for sure. One of the things that really is different about, about Toronto is the proportion of the population that belongs to a racialized group. So at Statistics Canada, we have kind of a, um, uh, we work hard to, to try to talk about uh, like racialized groups, or the older term, which would be visible minorities, in a respectful manner. But it's really, really hard to get exactly right. So, so bear with me, please. Um, what we have here in, in what we call now racialized groups um, would be essentially um, um, members of Canada who identify in one of these 18 or 20 groups that are, that are, that are listed there on the slide. I hope you can see it well enough. I'll just mention that um, among the different uh, uh, racialized groups, uh, the left pie chart shows Toronto segmented in pieces. I can even go over here and do this. This is the proportion of the population of Toronto that's South Asian, the proportion that's Chinese, the proportion that are Black, Filipino, Arab, Latin American, Southeast Asian, West Asian. Um, that'd be Korean, Japanese, and then multiple uh, visible minority people that identify as multiple visible minorities. So uh, you can see a very like only like less than half would be what you consider to be a not a visible minority. So that'd be, in the case of Toronto, it's, it's mostly white people and indigenous people, okay? If you look at Ontario, here's your not your visible minority category, and the visible minority population makes up only about um, uh, a sixth of that. So you can see it's, it's quite a bit different in its makeup, in its, in its um, uh, culture and history, and, and, and the types of groups, people that are living here. So, so that's part of what makes Toronto Toronto. And that's part of, um, it stands to reason that that, that that would be the case because so much of the growth is from international migration. And you know, over the last decades, international migration has largely been um, from countries uh, where um, uh, uh, non-white uh, populations are, are larger. And you know, as was just suggested and has been suggested all night, you know, some uh, some immigrants are more vulnerable than others. Um, we we know about immigrants that come to Canada and they have wealth, right? Or they have family ties and family connections and reunification, um, and they're able to uh, adapt quickly and buy homes and become um, uh, a part of of things like the Canadian dream, if you will, but. Some immigrants are more vulnerable than others, uh, such as refugees. Um, this chart shows fr uh, data from um, uh, immigration and uh, refu immigration, refugee, and citizenship Canada, and um, it shows the numbers of refugees admitted to Ontario each year. And uh, 2021 and 2022 stand at, stand at above other years. A little more than a little more than 35,000 refugees admitted into into Ontario. A great number of those, of course, would be coming to Toronto. 2023 is on on the same track. So if you if you see that that far as lower, well, of course, we're not finished 2023 yet. So that's really just the first um, six months or seven months or so of the year. So um, so again, um, another way in which uh, 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 you know we want to think about housing and we want to think about housing issues is just acknowledging that many immigrants that come um, are, are vulnerable. Another group uh, of vulnerable immigrants would be uh, some non-permanent residents that come to Canada. And I, I, you know, I don't wish, if this presentation had been presented tomorrow, <laughs> I could present to you brand new statistics from Statistics Canada on non-permanent residents. Non-permanent residents, of course, uh, includes people on um, study visas, um, and uh, um, uh, 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 temporary foreign workers, largely. So um, we're releasing new data on that tomorrow, so I, won't, uh, I can't 
show it to you today, but the numbers are, are, are big and have surged in the last couple of years. So, um, uh, again, uh, people who have come for study, with study permits, they're, they're attracted to the big universities, they're coming, they're coming to the big cities, many of, many of them. And, you know, without passing any you know, positive or negative affect on that or inflection, they need a place to live, right? They need a roof and they take up a, a, sh a shelter of some kind. So when you're, you know, when we have these policies that bring in so many, say, temporary foreign workers or, or students that have to you know, think about that there are, uh, these place stresses on housing markets. And I mentioned this quickly before about how population was so uh, uh, concentrated in the downtown. <laughs> so what I have here is I have sort of a, a bird's eye view of what we call the census metropolitan area of Toronto. So this is the, you know, the city of Toronto, but all the adjacent um, municipalities as well that kind of combine together to, to, to create a, 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 a big labor, labor market system, you know, like people commute all over the place in here. And this is sort of the, the, the urban area that supports um, and, and it, essentially part of Toronto in many ways. You can't really drive, you know, uh, uh, you know there's not much, well, I don't, I'm not even going to talk about green space, okay? <laughs> um, you see the center of Toronto here, and I've colored it black, and I have different growth rates along the, along the bottom, and you can't see it up there, so I'm going to read them for you. The downtown of Toronto, in the last, well, in the five years in between the, the 2016 census and the 21 census, grew by 16%. So, so what that means is as you're walking down Queen Street, one out of every eight people that you walk by wasn't there five years ago, <laughs> right? So that's how, that's, how much, that's how many more people there are in downtown Toronto in just five years. Um, and, and I know that Toronto is building like crazy to try to accommodate this. I walked today from um, Union Station uh, to Street Haven, and I, I can tell you, I must have walked by uh, dozens of towers going up. So, you know, the growth is, is, is going to continue. Um, it's much lower in the urban fringe, right? So this this uh, kind of belt of the old suburbs, even the older, older suburbs, or well, the, near, the near suburbs, is 1.4%, remember 16, 1.4, 1.7. This area out here is less than 1%. Right, so when we talk about growing Toronto, we're, you know there is that element of it is getting bigger geographically, and the labor market's getting bigger, and it's more integrated. But but you know, a big part of it is this little space around where we are right here today. So amongst all of that thing, like, what's the Canadian dream, right? So. You know, part of it is you kind of, you, you grow up, you leave your parents' house and you form your own household and then you buy a house, right? That's kind of part, traditionally, and I know I'm, 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 I'm looking around and I'm seeing a lot of faces that are much, much younger than mine, um, and maybe the dream has changed. But the traditional dream is that, is that home ownership was something that's kind of like a rite of passage or it's a move into, into adulthood or, you know, I'm ready to have a family now because I've settled down and I've got a home. Well, that's actually not, that, that's a dream that's kind of fading. So we see it here in the home ownership rate, which is the percentage of, of people or families that own a home. Now they don't own it outright, they might have a mortgage, but they own a home. And we can see that this big boom, you know, from 60% to almost 70%, starting in 1971, peaking in about 2011, okay? And then, you know, we all know what happened, you know, starting around 10 years ago, house prices started to skyrocket, scarcity started to, to, to become more binding, and um, the home ownership rate started to decline. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but, um, you know, if, if, continue, if the housing market continues to, you know, have the stresses that it has now, and, um, uh, 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 you know, continues along this path, it, you know, one could imagine that it would continue to decline. But the flip side of that is that you have less homeowners, you have more renters, right? So renters need, need places to live, right? So, you know, there's a, there's a real need because of this turnaround um, to 
uh, to, to develop more purpose-built rental, for example. Um, I was joking with my wife the other day about, about a purpose-built rental that's just down the street from us in Ottawa that, that they're almost finished doing. It took them probably five years to build it. I would estimate that it has 120 units in it, maybe. It's a big building. But then we thought about, well, five years to put 120 units here, how long would it take to build 120 houses? If you got the land, they just slap those things up really, really fast, you know? So building purpose, build rentals, you know, there's a lot to it, right? It's a real challenge, I think. Here we show the increase in the, um, uh, 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 the um, proportion of the number of people who are renting uh, in some of the larger cities in Canada. And in Toronto, uh, I can hardly even read that, but I think it's around 27%. Um, Ottawa's about the same. Calgary's higher. Uh, Vancouver's about the same. The red uh, uh, ones here are ones that have grown faster, even faster than that. So, you know, Kitchener, uh, Barrie, my hometown, um, Kelowna, uh, these are all places that have uh, rental populations that are growing even faster than Toronto. So, uh, again, um, there's a real demand out there for rental. Um, and uh, uh, the cities, uh, cities are probably, I guess, doing the best that they can to keep up. To tie the knot back up to uh, rentals and uh, new Canadians, well, you know, it's, it also stands to reason, and the statistics show it, newcomers to Canada are much more likely to be renters than owners. Um, you know, they're establishing a foothold. Um, and um, they may not always be coming with um, uh, a, a large amount of wealth so that they can buy a home, so, they, so they'll rent. So again, thinking it through, if Canada is relying more upon immigration to maintain and grow its population, here go, <laughs> it needs more rents, right? So we'll need, need more rental uh, apartments as well. So according to these statistics, about 56% of recent immigrants uh, rented their dwelling. Um, so, so well more than half. By comparison, the national average is about 27%. Okay, so, so again, it's just trying to um, underscore how all of these, the demographic and the type of building that you live in and how the finances all work together are all playing out. And more housing is condominium. So that's definitely true down here. I believe most of these, many of these places that are going up are condominiums. And um, so it turns out that if you look at the statistics, about a third of homes built in the last five years were condominiums. Um, and uh, about uh, a quarter of occupied dwellings in, in, in uh, Toronto were condominiums. Um, that's a generational shift, I think. Um, I don't know if that was the case a generation ago. And this is interesting. So in downtown Toronto, Half of the dwellings, well over half of the dwellings, were condos. And more than half of these condos were rented. Right? So like a condo is something that's owned by somebody, but, but then when it's rented to somebody else, it becomes what we call the secondary rental market. So you've got your primary rental market, which is your purpose-built rentals. And then you've got your secondary rental market, which clearly is becoming more and more important. These can be uh, real estate trusts. They might be um, mom and pop kind of uh, setups, um, it can be a variety of different things. And I guess in the context of everything, and I'm not you know, passing judgment, I don't really un understand how people feel about this on the ground. I don't know how people feel on, this, on the ground. But in, a, but in a way, this has provided a relief valve, right? This, this whole process, because you can imagine how hard it would be to live in Toronto if, if these places weren't available to rent, right? So, uh, you know, uh, trying to present a balanced picture here, but a lot, a lot of condos are rentals now. Um, I hope you're not all sitting there and going, "Well, when's he going to tell us something we don't already know?" <laughs> I hope I'm at least being entertaining, telling you something that you already know. Um, and, and another reason why this is perhaps important is, um, uh, you know, going back to that Canadian dream, um, renters. Are tend to be less satisfied with their with their dwellings than others. So as our our our, our cities shift to being more places where people rent rather than where people own, you know something's got to change in order to maintain that level of satisfaction 
uh, you know, part of the national housing strategy is to provide people with housing that they like, right? So again, um, thinking about thinking about how people feel about their housing is important, and um, recognizing that people tend to be less satisfied with rental is, is, is also important. So here I'm going to talk for the next this slide and the next couple about you know what we could largely call the financialization of housing. So we all know what that is, right? I mentioned it already with with um, <coughs> condos being bought and then rented to others. You know, largely this is happening um, probably because people are hoping for a capital gain as they as the as the dwelling appreciates, and sometimes um, the rent can provide them with with a bit of. Uh, uh, extra income, I can imagine if you're a retired person and that's the way you want to, uh, uh, if that's the way you want to uh, support your retirement, you know, that you can imagine that being a case for a lot of people as well. So the first thing I want to mention is that, like your house is your, house is your biggest asset, we all know that. Um, and, you know, um, every now and then we hear stories. Okay, about about the, 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 the young man or woman who rents and saves all of their money and builds up this great big nest egg, you know, by living frugally and investing wisely, and um, uh, uh, you know develops this 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 you know becomes becomes wealthy by just you know but what doesn't buy a house? I can tell you from looking at the data that those those people are very rare, very 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 rare. Um, most people who rent do not have a lot of wealth and don't build up a lot of wealth. Um, on the other hand, most people who own a house, even if, even with a mortgage, build up a lot of wealth. Um, and uh, you know, even with a mortgage, even though the mortgage is as outrageous as they are now, as long as the you know the value of the house is increasing, like we all know the game that's been being played in the last five years, ten years, right? As long as the value is going up. Um, you're, you're building net worth, right? You're building equity. And that creates, a, for some people, it creates a rung in the housing ladder. They can buy a small place, a condo, and then another place, and then another place. And this becomes a, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But there's a tremendous, like in the data, there's a tr there is, it's true. There's a tremendous difference in wealth among uh, those who own a home and those who do not. If you, look at, if you look at seniors and you think about, well, okay, seniors in poverty, you can almost uh, draw the line. Like seniors in poverty can be, can be almost perfectly discriminated by whether or not they own the home. Um, it's really, you know, it's just a fact. A second point that I'd like to make is about how important the home has become also as a place to work, right? So with the pandemic and with the trends and the changes in work, people have become, um, uh, you know, more likely to work at home. Um, I, I work at home now, and I never did before the pandemic. I don't work there every day, but I have a nice little office. I'm happy with that. I own a house. I'm happy about that. Um, but I can imagine my wife and I and our dog, and during the pandemic, our two teenage children, living in an apartment trying to get by, you know, while we're all looking at the computer screens, it would have been, we would have had to change, we would have had to become, we would have had to become much more patient people than we are now, I think. Another element of the financialization of things is, is what's going on with investors. So I mentioned that before in the condo picture. So it turns out that in Toronto, more than 20% of properties are owned as an investment property. So by investment property, I mean um, this is a person who owns more than one property and only lives in one of them. Okay, so, so the second one we call an investment property. And um, so, you know, a quarter of, not a quarter, but one in five. Property one, one in five properties in uh, in Toronto are investment properties. It can be owned by people or by investment trusts or whatever. But you know that's sort of giving you that sense of the secondary market. It's much lower in the rest of Ontario. Um, and among these investors are non-residents, right? So we all know about non-resident investors. And our statistics say that about four percent of properties are owned by non-resident investors. So it's maybe not as big as some people were worried it was, and I know that there have been some public policy changes to, to help um, uh, ameliorate that, that trend and keep it from snowballing, but, um, but, but this is what the statistics tell us about. A little over 
uh, of, of dwellings are owned by an, as an investment property by somebody, and about 4% overall are owned by non-residents of Canada. And then there's the Airbnbs, right? So we don't really have any statistics at Statistics Canada that, that, that connects Airbnbs to dwellings. Like we, we, um, we can't really gather that piece of information very well. Um, but a lot of people have, have um, thought about it. This is a, a clip from a news article by Armin Yanizian, who uh, is a, a very um, well-respected uh, uh, Toronto economist. And, and she describes you know, the possibility of, of Airbnbs creating a, a supply crunch. Um, there are apparently about 16,000 Airbnbs available in Toronto right now. You know, you could think about it in terms of, well, that's a drop in the bucket compared to the 1.2 million dwellings. But, but it's, 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 it's that many taken off the market. Like when, and um, so when those are, like where they are matters too, right? So there's a lot, there's a lot to be think, thought about in terms of Airbnb. It's not just the numbers, and it's a small number, but where they are matters too. Um, and uh, so we can think about that as being another piece to the puzzle. And then we have uh, vacant land, okay? So less and less vacant land um, in the greater Toronto area. In Toronto, uh, the, the, the city part of it, that's a light blue color, which corresponds to my legend too. Um, over this period of time, so, so two years, the numbers of properties uh, that were vacant in Toronto declined by, well, something between five and 15%. Sorry, I'm not more precise than that I wish for. But the, but the point being that, that you know, they're declining, and it's declining all across the board, some places faster than others. And finally, um, it's great to want to build houses, but you have to have people that, that can build them. And um, the supply chains are bottlenecked, and this has been going on since the pandemic started. Um, one can see a big gap between housing starts and housing completions. Like, even five years ago, they were more or less the same, right? So you start, start a dwelling, you complete a dwelling. But, but right now, now these people get completed eventually, but are they taking longer to complete? They have enough workers to finish these. First bar shows us how many were started, big number, and the second bar shows us how many were completed at the same time. So you can see that there's there's just a you know, do I have to tell you there's a lot of construction going on? <laughs> there is a lot of construction going on. And the cost of construction is increasing. So when you look at the cost of residential construction, they're up uh, nearly 20% in Toronto. And that's uh, what's that first quarter of 2022 to first quarter of 2023. That's inflation. So that's almost 20% a year. That's that's an, that's that's something else. Uh, I did a little renovation um, on my uh, house during the pandemic, and I know how much the two by fours went. Um, they were very very expensive, but this is this is a lot. And thinking about consumer prices, we all know about the rise in the, in the consumer prices as well. So. Here we have the blue line is all items, up uh, nearly 30 percent since 2015, especially in the last two years. The um, the orange is sort of the housing cost component of that, and the jaggedy line there that's your utilities. So even if you're a senior and you own your home outright, um, you still may be feeling the pinch because your utility bill is up 15 percent, right? So so uh, that's that's the picture on price. So all this comes together and creates a lot of stress and strain on Canadian families. What we have here is the answers to a question. We ask people, how difficult are you finding it? Or are you difficult? I can't remember the exact posing of it, but the idea is, is, is how difficult is it for you to meet your nece necessary food, shelter, clothing, transportation, and your other necessities, like the things that you need to get by for you and your family? How difficult is that getting? And the blue line shows a proportion of people that say very difficult or difficult. So this is sort of um, second half of the pandemic lockdown period. And it wasn't actually like climbing all that much. And we as statisticians were surprised until we, until we discovered from looking at the numbers how much this, the, the pandemic benefits were helping. Right? So the pandemic benefits were really helping people with their cost of living. 
And then um, moving along, it starts to pick up again in 2022 as the pandemic benefits start phasing out. The big price increases at the end of 2022, people really felt that. And it's come back to earth a little bit now for the second quarter, but you know, up to about now, it's come back to earth a little bit with inflation. It really demonstrates that the last year's been hard for people. And the proportion of people that found it easy to make those costs has declined almost linearly. So people are no longer finding it easy. Some people are finding it quite a bit harder. And this kind of data is really good because we can split it among different groups to see who's feeling the pinch the most. And when we look at it, we see you know, unemployed people, so people who are looking for work. We see renters, we see recent immigrants, um, people living with children, racialized population overall, but also the South Asian, black population, and, uh, oh, that would be black Canadians, sorry. <laughs> indigenous people, persons with a disability, and LGBTQ2 plus population all have incidents of, of saying that things are unaffordable to them that are higher than, um, than others. And we all know this, right? The average trend is just gone um, really, really crazy. Um, from 2011 to 2022 for Toronto, this is purpose built only, two bedroom only, the increase is about 55%. You know, you, if you mixed in all that secondary uh, rental, um, et cetera, I'm not sure if it would be a bigger or smaller increase, but I think that, you know, I think we can assume that it's a pretty high rate of increase. Actually, in some of the statistics that I'll show you in a minute, it includes that secondary market, and yeah, it's, it's increasing in the secondary market as well. These two little points on the end are kind of interesting and important. The gray one up at the top tells us in 2022 what the asking value was for a um, for an apartment that had turnover, right? So the blue line is, is not just the ones that are available on the market at a point in time, but also the ones that are occupied, okay? So, you know, there's some rent controls, there's some staticness in prices when, when a place is occupied. But when it turns over, there's an opportunity to do a renovation, to change the terms of the lease, and the rent can go up. And we see from that great point, that's the average um, price of a place that had just gone through a turnover. And the orange line is the average price of a place that has not gone through a turnover. So we see, you know, that's part of the process as people, you know, rents are, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a less, um, not stable, that's not the word I'm looking for. It's, 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 a, it's a more fluid type of housing tenure, right? And so when, as that fluidity churns, um, there's opportunities for the price of rent to go up. So I, I promised um, uh, uh, Sumi that I would get out the microscope. <laughs> and if those, those numbers were all for Toronto, but we can, with, with our data at Statistics Canada, we can go right down to neighborhoods. And, um, and uh, I didn't realize how much she wanted me to do Moss Park, but I did, um, I did Regent Park. <laughs> so um, these are what you call census tracts. So I believe we are somewhere over here, I think. Um, and uh, that looks like a big park. And I think that we're probably right at the bottom of that zero in the, in the zero, zero 030 right now. So we're in uh, what, you know, for lack of a better term, I'll call South Region Park, and then there's North Region Park, and those are the two uh, uh, neighborhoods that I'm gonna look at and break down a little bit more. I'm gonna test your eyesight, and I really apologize for this because I didn't really know what kind of screen or projection we would have. You won't be able to read the numbers on the next page. But what I've done is I've profiled um, these two neighborhoods, what I call 30 and 31, or North and South Region Park along a number of different characteristics, including what's the population, how much has it grown, um, what the proportion of immigrants are, what the proportion of recent immigrants are, what proportions in a racialized group, what the groups are, what proportion are owner households, what proportion are rental households. And then I, I so this is sort of like the population and dwelling type set of statistics. And I try and draw some conclusions, right? now. These neighborhoods are changing a lot. Like I was struck today walking through them. They're full of towers that are all look brand new to me. 
Um, so these, these neighborhoods are transforming massively. And I think the numbers show that. So if you look, and I, I'm sorry, you probably can't see it, but if you look at the second column here, it's 0030, so that's the South Barber Region Park where we are right now. The population here in the last 10 years has grown by 124%. So it used to be 3,000, it's now 7,000. Right, so there's more, more than twice as many more people in this little block <laughs> living here than there were just 10 years ago. That's a tremendous change. Um, in this neighborhood, uh, uh, people who live here are more likely to be black people. Um, they're uh, about equally likely to be South, a South Asian as the, rest of, uh, as the rest of Toronto. Moving to the north part of Re Regent Park, there, people, are, people in that area are more likely to be South Asian. Um, and also, again, more likely to be black people. And so you see with this census data, we can start to think about, okay, what's the process of what's going on here? Um, definitely a huge population growth. Definitely a big concentration of, um, of racialized groups. Um, some racialized groups can be at risk, so that's something to think about. Um, and big transformations in owners and renter households. This one that we're in right now has added, uh, it looks like about 900 owner households um, and over 1,000 renter households um, in just this 10 year period. So um, again, a big, transformation of what's going on in this particular place where we are right now. And we can also look at income and shelter costs. So the shelter costs, I'll stick with, with where we are right now, this region park. So cost for a renter in 2011, the average, believe it or not, was $681 okay, for, a, for a unit. Now that doesn't control for the type of unit. It includes uh, social housing. It's what people were paying according to the census. Now it's $1,500. Okay? So some of you might go like, oh, I'd love to get an apartment down here for 1500 <laughs> Bear with me, I know, that, I know that, that these numbers seem odd because what you're looking at is you're looking at what the offers are. But this, what this tells you is what people are paying now. Um, and a lot of people are in social housing, they're staying here, they're not moving, they're not freeing up those apartments and giving other people the opportunity. Why should they, right? That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying that you know, they don't have that opportunity for the turnover price hikes and stuff like that. So, so usually the, the stock of dwellings in an area are, the, the rents are much lower than what you see on Kijiji if you're looking for rents, okay? And then um, we have incomes, and incomes have gone up as well. 30% uh, in Toronto for a household in 10 years, 40% in this area here, 64% uh, in the area on the other side of Dundas. So, so pretty solid uh, income growth as well across all of these places. And um, the question is, is the income growth keeping up with the, the, the shelter costs and how is that all working out at the household level? If we look at across the poverty rate, the poverty rate is, is higher, somewhat higher in the north part of Region Park than it is in the south part. Last slide that does this deep dive, I think, I hope, brings all this together a little bit. And it's kind of the outcome. Like, so I talked about the population, I've talked about the incomes and the shelter costs and all the different things that are going on. I mentioned a little bit about refugees and public and permanent residents. All this comes out of the housing market in the end in terms of households and core housing need. Core housing need is a statistic. The federal government uses it to monitor the national housing strategy. It's not perfect, but it's, but it's, but it's a good indicator. It's very closely related to poverty. And what it does is it, is it tells you a, a, a household is in core housing need if their household is not, if their if they're dwelling is not affordable, and by not affordable I mean it eats up more than 30% of their income, okay? And it's not suitable, and by suitable I mean that it doesn't meet the national occupancy standards in terms of crowding, okay? So there's too many people in the dwelling for the size of the dwelling. And if it needs uh, major repairs, then it's not considered uh, appropriate either. So if, if it fails all three of, any one of those three tests, any one of those three tests that can be considered a core housing need, if and only if, okay, this is, I'm sorry, this gets complicated. If and only if that person couldn't just pack up and leave and, and, and get an affordable how you know, dwelling elsewhere. So that takes out all of the people that are kind of, you know, house poor because they have, you know, big houses and they're just trying to keep up with the mortgage. So, so this is really looking at a part of the market that where people are screened. 
And we can see that the core level of core housing is quite high in Regent Park North. Um, a little lower in South and then Toronto and Ontario. And what I found really interesting unpacking this was for the North part here, it wasn't necessarily because of, of, a, of a problem with affordability. In their case, it was because of crowding. They, had, um, a much, they were much more likely to be living in crowded dwellings, meaning too many people living in, in the space. That could be a single mother in a one bedroom apartment. Right? So according to the national occupancy standard, they should each have their own bedroom. Okay? Um, it could include uh, two, uh, two roommates and one of them is living uh, in, the, in the living room. Right? According to the national occupancy standard, they should have, they should have two bedrooms. So I, I found this really fascinating. Uh, a rate of crowding of that high, uh, what's it, about 20%, um, is pretty rare in the data. So it tells you something about, about, uh, about how people are grouping together in order to keep their um, places affordable in this day of poverty. Last couple of slides that I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk, I just want to mention a little bit about the national housing strategy. But mainly I want to use this as a launching pad to talk about homelessness. Okay? So I'm from Statistics Canada. Statistics Canada conducts a census. We do work with administrative data. Frankly, um, the homeless population is, is, is among the most difficult to measure, whether that be the unsheltered, the sheltered, or the hidden, okay? Um, and, and that's because, A, they're difficult to reach, expensive to reach, um, and, 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 and they're just very difficult to enumerate in general in terms of finding them, gathering information on them. Sometimes homeless people don't trust the enumerators. Sometimes, um, uh, you know, the, the, the location where they are isn't accessible to an enumerator. So, we, you know, we acknowledge that we want to work more on understanding better what's going on in the homelessness sphere. One of the places where we look for information is in the point in time counts. So the point in time counts are conducted by a local organization with uh, the aid of um, Infrastructure Canada. And in these cases, they have surveyors that go uh, out and try to enumerate people on a particular day uh, to see how many people are in uh, uh, are homeless on a particular day. And they classify people according to whether they are unsheltered or sheltered or in transition housing. And um, uh, you know, we see here from the last point in time count, which was conducted in 2020, that about a quarter were in uh, uh, unsheltered situations. So this is this is largely living on. Um, and then about 60% uh, were in sheltered situations, and 12% were in transitional housing. But when you look across the two, uh, you look across the 2018 to 2020 period, you see that the numbers of people that they're finding is increased by 12%. Um, and if you uh, break it down according to who, right, about 35% uh, are identified as indigenous. Um, a large, larger number are male than female, but there's a significant uh, number here that are gender diverse. Uh, we have about uh, one in five are children and youth. And among the children and youth, one in four uh, identify as, um, uh, well, 2SLGBTQI+. That's what uh, um, Infrastructure Canada uses. At SACAM, we, use, we often use LGBTQ2+, which goes a little bit easier off my tongue, but the point being, that's a, that's a pretty large number, um, a large proportion of homeless youth are, uh, are in that situation, identified that way. So in conclusion, I hope I, I hope I told a decent story. I hope I was reasonably entertaining. I hope I stayed in time. <laughs> Um, and I hope I uh, showed you a number of ways that, that different pieces of data knit together to tell us what's going on in terms of the housing story. Um, I showed you some detail about Regent Park, but this same detail can be downloaded and, and built by using available data from Statistics Canada right off the website. So um, I promised Sue me a profile on, on, on Moss Park, she's going to get it. Um, and, and uh, you know, it'd be great if, uh, if those of you who have access to a, to a keen um, Microsoft Excel user or a 
data scientist or something, and if you want to have this information for yourself, it's all available on the StatCan website. Uh, that's my contact information if anybody wants to drop me a line. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm finished and I'm happy to take any questions. Or The data is very scary, but um, mine is back to uh, like some of the presentation that uh, we made here earlier by Sumi herself and then uh, the team here. But I wanted to add on to some of the ambitious plans of Sumi, some of the submissions, to add a program called Knocking Doors. Uh, in that, <clears throat> most of the, I'm imploring also the board actually, to look into, because of the trends that uh, Andrew is presenting here, they are very real and also scary at the same time because the certainty of the future is very slim. What I'm trying to say is <clears throat> we need to, uh, the board has to look into having this amorphous uh, plan that can be able to have, uh, I fear white elephant projects, but if you can have a black elephant project that would be good, whereby you look at uh, doing, um, let's say, structure that can really be more bigger than what we are trying to look at based on the fact that the trends and the needs are increasing day by day, but then in, uh, as, uh, in Sumi's voice, smallishness. That smallish, now the expectations are extremely huge. So if you have a, a five-year structural plan and say, okay, let's knock some doors, and then have this, uh, because looking at the, 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 the donors and the big uh, partnerships that you have on board already, if you have this big black elephant project, say a 10 year storage structure of uh, a new shelter of uh, Street Heaven, that makes a big voice to whoever you're lobbying to, to say, look, we are, we have we have been 60 years here, now we want to spend the next few years in this new structure. And I think to the, to the board and the new members of the board that have just come in, I think that gives uh, a bigger scope of who we can be able to help because the need out there is so real and is very, very um, painful for the team. Some people like the... Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm George, by the way, I'm from African Center for Refugees. Sometimes when we refer or have Street Heaven as one of our secondary or a run-to agency, and they are also, they, the hands are so tight that they cannot even help us, and we are turning our backs to the people that, like, like, like him, that need our help. It's very, um, it's very stressful actually, like it's occupational stress, where you know very well that you've turned down someone that really has no anywhere else to look up to. Like the story of Teresa, if that opportunity didn't come through, how could we just imagine now how she would be spending her time? So I believe that we need to initiate some black elephant projects. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your comment. And I think today's AGM really, um, it went from just us, the board presenting our financials, our strategic plan, electing new board member. I think it added an extra level of depth to it, to hearing Teresa's personal story. And then also Andrew wrapped it up with real numbers that how the city is doing, how our community is doing, and how Canada is doing it really shows how critical the housing crisis is in our country, in particularly in our city, in our neighborhood, in downtown Toronto. And you know, also the two gentlemen who raised the question and also suggestion, it really echoes that it's not just the number on the screen, it is affecting every single person, every single person who is sitting in this room. And so I would say um, to wrap up this AGM, and we are in a democratic society. And uh, you know, I'm from I'm an immigrant from China. So back home, it wasn't like this. It wasn't um, you know if you, there is an issue, 
you don't really have a voice. So all of us here have a voice, and your suggestion is exactly what a board is working towards, is increasing density, is increasing corporate partnership, increasing our um, brand awareness in the community, and then also to help Street Haven to get more funding so we can then you know, start those projects and have you know, bigger, bigger impact in our community. And a lot of partners are sitting here today, like Andrew from CMHC, for example, and we are, that's all we are working towards is to create more beds, to help more people. And that we are, you know, it's a volunteer board. We are here as volunteers to the organization to support every single member, to support SUMI, to accomplish our mission. So I would say, you know, how we can re really make an impact is not just at the four level. Every single one sitting here, we have a voice. You know, uh, Kristen Wong Tam, who was just here earlier, local counselor, and she is also trying to help us to advocate. So if, you know, talk to your local counselor, talk to your um, local politicians, and that's how we can make a difference and how we can make an impact. And, you know, just, if we don't use our voice, it's really very little that we can do. And I think that's what Sumi and the team has been advocating for, on our behalf for the last year. So, um, Thank you everyone for coming, and it's been a real pleasure. And also, if you have any suggestions, feel free to reach out to us. And then also, you know, we are um, you know, in the process of establishing our new mission and vision. So if you want to reach out to me personally as well, feel free to you know, shoot me an email if you have new ideas. But um, thanks everyone, and uh, I will hand the mic to Sumi to wrap it up. It's been a long day, I'm sure you don't need me saying more. Just to thank all of you for coming. We hope that you found uh, this year's AGM an interesting event. Um, we hope you found uh, information that was insightful from Rose, uh, from all of our speakers actually, from Teresa, from uh, Andrew, and, um, and of course from the board and myself. Uh, thank you again. I uh, hope you like the food as well. That came from, right from our kitchen. Have a nice night and we'll see you next year. Take care. <laughs>